You know how these kinds of videos work. Even though I swear I have never had more fun at a film I lost all patience for within 50 seconds, I can't not put Cats on this list. It's not a better made movie than most of the films on here, but in spite of everything in it being an absolute travesty, Cats has a ton of entertainment value. Value that comes from the rapidity with which mistakes are made. It's like Tom Hooper took the decision-making skills he used to cast Russell Crowe as Javert and applied that to an entire movie. Now prisoner 2460, 2460451! So I didn't put Cats on the list because I hate it, but because I'm pretty sure God would get mad at me if I didn't. Terminator Dark Fate isn't the worst made movie in the world, but the screenplay is paced so unevenly and has a lot of lazy shortcuts to move the plot forward. It didn't help that it unwrites a lot of the franchise lore, even though, given what their franchise has been through, you're a moron if you still care about that. Had I been at more movies this year, I probably would not have put this on the list at all, because I liked Linda Hamilton and the first action scene was pretty good, but the film is just so uncreatively written and uneventful. A long time ago, 2015 to be exact, a movie called Avengers Age of Ultron came out. It didn't get nearly the critical or fan acclaim the first Avengers did, and people started coining the phrase superhero fatigue. We will eventually get tired of comic book movies, because that's just how trends work in Hollywood. But I was a staunch defender that we weren't tired yet, and certainly wouldn't be until the Avengers killed Thanos. Spider-Man Far From Home proves that I was exactly right. There is a clear difference in the level of creativity and writing from even Marvel's recent outings, like Black Panther, Thor 3, and even the Ant-Man films. For like 80% of the movie, the villains are generic elemental giants, Mysterio is an absolute waste of a character, the plot moves along like it's strapped to a Grecian column. It does things wrong, I didn't even know you could fuck up. Like making JB Smoove unfunny. And that's without pointing out Marvel's straight up lied to us about there being a multiverse. You're saying there's a multiverse? I liked the first It movie, but Chapter 2 dropped the ball in a profound way. Already stupid long, a good hour of this movie is watching scenes that are structured the exact same, culminating in a jump scare and CGI monster. There's no sense of tone. The logic of the movie and the major payoffs to the story beats either don't make any sense or go by so quick they don't matter at all, meaning all that time they wasted was for no reason. The movie breaks its own rules a lot. During the climax, it's well established that Pennywise can control reality like he's got the Infinity Gauntlet, but their plan is, hey, let's lure Pennywise over there, as if he can't just change the layout of the cave before they come to the exact same conclusion they did in the first one and just decide they aren't scared of him and he shrinks into the ginger dead man. Fast and Furious is like the Call of Duty of movies, except you aren't subject to kids and incels calling you the N-word. I am not immune to their superficial charms. Bruh. Just give me some fun action and characters who don't piss me off. Like, look at this scene from number 8, where The Rock fights these guys. Now see, that's funny, because, like, what the f*** did he do there? Hobbs and Shaw already has a bad story, even by the franchise standard, but at least in the other ones, there's a variety of dynamics because there's so many characters. Hobbs and Shaw have one dynamic that gets old in two minutes. If you want action, it's there, I guess, but why is your Fast and Furious movie mostly based around fistfights that always end in a draw? Oh, it's because the actors literally aren't allowed to lose! That makes for good action, right, fellas? There is a long-standing trend of adaptations of old nostalgic properties that notoriously dismiss their source material to focus on some bland assholes. Transformers, Smurfs, that new Sonic movie. We don't care about these flavorless, annoying people. If you're gonna make a Pokemon movie, don't make it about the screamy kid from Jurassic World 2 teaming up with Hillary Clinton to look for his dad. 90% of the Pokemon just sit around and do nothing. There's only one real battle. The movie never really decides if it wants to satisfy kids or older fans, so it decides to do neither. 
If you're older than nine, you'll be bored stiff by the dumbass mystery. If you're younger than nine, the pace and aesthetic are too mellow. There is a lot of Pikachu in this though. So if you want a lot of Pikachu and that's enough, then you'll like it. Rise of Skywalker does itself no favors with the way it chose to end the trilogy, but that's the least of its problems. Two thirds of this climactic series finale is just chasing a MacGuffin, which is totally okay, cause turns out the MacGuffin didn't even matter. Everything they do is at such a disconnect with where the trilogy could have gone after the last one. The Last Jedi gave just as much material to work with as it took away, so it really feels like J.J. Abrams just gave up when he didn't have to. It's a lazy, sarcastic approach to directing a film people really cared about. Either way, this film is an absolute train wreck. It's edited to the bare function a movie can accomplish. There's not a single scene that gives you enough time to breathe for anything to actually resonate with you. The action sucks, most of the characters are completely useless, the climax is an insulting strobe-like cluster <coughs> But Palpatine shooting his lightning... <coughs> ...sounded like this. I died laughing in the theater, and now I'm in hell, because the last movie I ever watched was Rise of Skywalker. There is a difference between a movie using social messages in their plot, and a movie using social messages as their plot. Black Christmas is the latter. It's not like Captain Marvel or Charlie's Angels where, yeah, there's politics, but there's also a story it's framed around. Black Christmas is that, but backwards. There are sparse traces of a plot in there towards the end, but most of the movie is just scene after scene of characters whose moral designation is wholly dependent on their gender. And make no bones about it, Black Christmas's impression of gender is that you are either a woman and therefore inherently superior, or an awful rapist man and you suck dick. Even though it is impossible to divorce the politics from this film on just a plot level, if you decide to try, you'll uncover one of the most astronomically incompetent stories in a mainstream horror film. The only fathomable way you'll like this movie is if you agree with the film's politics to the point you ignore layer after layer of hilariously terrible writing. And if you do... Honestly, stop watching my videos. I don't want you here. Not that I really cared about the original all that much, but Dumbo seems like the kind of movie an AI would procedurally generate if you fit it 200 CVS receipts worth of studio notes. There's just this non-human quality to everything, even down to its downright ugly visual style. Watching Dumbo is like watching a regular movie, but with a headache so bad it blurred your vision. It's the lack of self-awareness that hurts it the most. Michael Keaton assimilating everything in service of a giant theme park as the villain when Disney is purchasing, gutting, and profiting off of real-life studios and businesses the same way is presented completely straight. And at some point, you have to wonder if the irony might manifest into an eldritch abomination and tear Bob Iger limb from limb. That's not pot calling the kettle black, that's pot setting the house on fire and calling kettle black because it's covered head to toe in burnt flesh. The f***ing Lug Noog is Disney's worst movie since the last time they screwed up one of these live action reboots. Someone thought the best way to remake a Disney classic known specifically for the emotional impact it had on audiences was to make every character an emotionless photorealistic animal. Remember the breathtaking colorful visuals of I just can't wait to be king? Well, too bad, dickhead, here's two brown lion cubs running through a dirty watering hole with the color palette of a skid mark. You want to see the characters' emotions vary depending on what's happening to them? F*** you, Simba has the same exact expression through the entire movie, regardless of context. Let's just take everything that made the original an effective, beautiful piece of art and stab it in the face. The Lion King remake is the ultimate in intentionally cutting corners, falsely justified as a filmmaking decision. Just claim that photorealism was the ultimate goal, and suddenly you don't have to waste time making the characters emote or get good voice performances, even though some characters are played by the exact same person. If you didn't like James Earl Jones' new delivery, you could have literally used the same recording from 1994! Pretty much every pivotal scene in the movie warrants a half-hour-long video explaining how much they've missed the point. 
Nothing they've added matters at all. Whether it's your favorite animated movie or not, nobody can deny The Lion King is a shining example of Disney at the height of their powers. The film had imagination and heart just seeping out of every scene. It has etched itself into the memory of every generation that grew up watching it. This? This is an indefensible painted corpse. I like to pick my battles saying this kind of stuff, but the Lion King remake is a genuine affront to the art of filmmaking and demonstrates, just like the Beauty and the Beast one, that at their core, Disney does not understand what made their own story so compelling or does not care.